Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week. This is the show that I release every Monday to keep you in the loop about space news, and we've once again got a lot to talk about. SpaceX Starship updates, another OneWeb launch from India, the inaugural launch of Relativity Space's Terran 1, Artemis updates, Rocket Lab Electron, and much, much more. Down at Starbase, work has been ongoing at the orbital launch mount for the past few months. This work continued last week as more shielding was added to the orbital launch mount overnight, with more panels being installed on the upper deck as well. We also saw the pouring of concrete into the launch mount's legs, which will significantly increase their strength and their ability to withstand the monstrous forces that they'll be subjected to for the first Starship orbital flight test. Monday morning saw the installation of the very last panel segment for the new shielding that wraps around the walkway on the outside of the orbital launch mount, sealing off the inside for good. Curiously, the new second set of stairs that was being added to the launch mount was removed last week and subsequently driven down the highway towards the SPMT storage area. It's not quite clear why SpaceX decided to remove the new stairs at this stage. The Mega Bay was a hive of booster stacking activity last week. On Wednesday morning, Booster 10's methane section was lifted in the Mega Bay, where it was lofted on top of the liquid oxygen tank section in preparation for final stacking of this booster. Booster 11 has been making progress as well. Here you can see its common dome section being moved into the mega bay to begin initial stacking operations. Yes, SpaceX has seemingly doubled their stacking capacity for boosters in the mega bay. There is now a second turntable and associated welding robot, which was tested outside the mega bay on Friday using this five ring stack barrel segment. This means that there is now a welding station on both the left and the right sides of the entranceway of the mega bay, a move made in response to the surge in production levels at Starbase as SpaceX strives to rapidly produce these vehicles. With the boosters now being able to be stacked in larger numbers, it is an exciting time for fans of Starship and I guess for the space industry as a whole. The high bay also saw its fair share of activity last week. Late on Sunday, Ship 26 was removed from the high bay after a very brief stint inside and moved into the rocket garden, where it was hooked up to a crane in preparation to be lifted onto the new Starship stand. The future of Ship 26 remains a bit of a mystery, so I'm curious to see what SpaceX does next with this vehicle. Back in the high bay, Ship 28's nose cone and payload segments were lifted for mating with the ship's common dome, which marks a slight change in the stacking process for starships. We also saw this mysterious black frame being moved from the mid bay to the high bay by this red crane on Wednesday. Tuesday night saw the first testing of a ship at the Macy's test site, as Lab Padre's Raptorous camera captured just <laughs> the cryo testing of Ship 25. SpaceX had a slightly quieter week than usual when it comes to their trusty Falcon 9. They performed just the one orbital launch. This was the Starlink Group 5-5 launch, which took place on the 24th of March from Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 40. The rocket was carrying 56 Starlink satellites, and following stage separation, the rocket's first stage touched down on the drone ship a shortfall of gravitas, closing this Falcon 9's first stage's 10th mission. Having previously supported the CRS-22 and 25 missions, Crew 3 and 4, Turksat 5B, Utilsat Hotbird 13G, O3B Empower, and two Starlink launches. I now have a couple of launches that I can't show you. <laughs> the first was the launch of an Indian launch vehicle Mark III rocket, and since the Indian government continues to copyright strike channels for showing launch footage, I gotta improvise here. <laughs> Regardless, this was the launch of OneWeb 18, which saw the rocket launch on the 26th of March, adding 36 more OneWeb satellites to the growing OneWeb internet constellation. The other launch that I can't show you was a Soyuz 2.1A that launched from the Plasetska launch site in Russia on the 23rd of March. The reason I can't show this to you is because I was simply unable to find any photos or videos of the launch, so I'll just use footage of something else instead. The payload was a BARS-M reconnaissance satellite, and that's basically all we know. <laughs> Rocket Lab, hot off the back of their Stronger Together launch on the 16th of March from the United States, launched another Electron rocket, this time from their Mahia Peninsula launch site in New Zealand on the 24th of March. This was their sixth dedicated launch for Black Sky, with this mission carrying the Black Sky 18 and 19 Earth observation satellites to low Earth orbit. The high-resolution images captured by the Black Sky constellation are used in conjunction with Black Sky's proprietary AI software to deliver analytics and insights to industries that include transportation, infrastructure, land use, defense, supply chain management, and humanitarian aid. 
One of the cooler aspects of this mission though was the Electron First Stage. This was another recovery attempt mission, although the rocket wasn't captured in the air by a helicopter and instead splashed down into the ocean and recovered by ship. It's probably not as imperative to avoid salt water damage to the vehicles at this stage, as I think Rocket Lab are still fairly early on in their rocket recovery program, and these recovery missions are more for data gathering rather than an opportunity to refly the boosters. There are a couple of Chinese space stories to cover this week. First of all, on the 22nd of March, we saw a Kwaizu 1A rocket launch four Tianmu 1 meteorological satellites to orbit, which will mainly be used to provide commercial meteorological data services, according to official sources. The other Chinese news from last week was their testing of a new parachute assisted recovery system for their boosters and fairings. According to the China Academy of Space Technology, they hope that over the next two years, there will be two tests for the recovering of boosters and two tests for the recovering of fairings. I have quite a bit to talk about with Artemis this week. Beginning with Artemis 1, NASA released some engineering footage of the Artemis 1 Orion capsule undergoing deservicing after its successful trip around the moon last year. I don't really have a great deal to say on this topic, but I figured you guys would find the time lapse interesting and the fact that the Artemis 1 mission is still a hive of activity over four months after it launched. In fact, just last week, on the 24th of March, teams celebrated the hanging of the Artemis 1 mission plaque during the Launch Director Award Ceremony in the Launch Control Center. Speaking of Artemis missions that haven't flown yet, the SLS rocket for Artemis 2 is well underway. NASA and Boeing engineers at the Mishu Assembly Facility in New Orleans have been busy working on the SLS rocket's core stage. This rocket is going to send four astronauts around the moon and then bring them back home, and last week the teams finished joining all the main structures together. On the 17th of March, they connected the engine section to the rest of the rocket, which was the last major step in the integration process. The next step will be to add the four RS-25 engines to the engine section, and then it'll be complete. The engine section is a pretty complicated bit of kit, and it's located at the bottom of the 65 meter or 212 foot tall core stage. It has tons of sensors and wiring and is responsible for powering the Artemis missions to the moon. The RS-25 engines and two solid rocket boosters will produce a whopping 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust or nearly 40,000 kilonewtons of thrust at liftoff. The engine section also houses the engines and includes essential systems for mounting, controlling and delivering fuel from the fuel tanks to the engines. Speaking of the engines, NASA recently conducted another exciting certification test of their newly upgraded RS-25 engine on the 21st of March, which is an important step towards future space launch system missions to deep space. During this test, operators fired the certification engine for a whopping 10 minutes, or 600 seconds, which is longer than the engines will need to fire during an actual mission. The test took place at the Fred Hayes test stand, and by testing the limits of engine performance through hot fires for longer duration and higher power levels, NASA can ensure that future flights will be safe and successful. This latest hot fire test marks the fourth test in a series to certify production of the new RS-25 engines for Artemis missions, which will enter service with the Artemis V mission. Speaking of new rockets, we have some new test footage of the Vulcan Centaur's core stage undergoing cryo-testing. Vulcan Centaur is a new medium to heavy lift launch vehicle developed by United Launch Alliance and designed to launch payloads into space for both government and commercial customers. That beautiful paint job was sadly covered up by the frost of the very cold fluids, but as the test wrapped up, we started to see that flame pattern reappear. I'm guessing that the flame design is a nod to the fact that this rocket is named after the Roman god of fire. When asked about how the test went on Twitter, CEO Tori Bruno commented that some minor adjustments on the ground side would be needed for future boosters. Up next for Vulcan is a static fire test. Here's hoping that we get more footage or maybe even a live stream of this when the time comes. A few weeks ago, we were all pretty excited to see the maiden flight of Relativity Space's Terran 1 launch vehicle. The Terran 1 is designed to provide cost-effective and flexible access to space for small satellites and is a two-stage launch vehicle that employs 3D printing technology to significantly reduce manufacturing complexity and costs. One of the rocket's key features is its engines, which are also produced using 3D printing technology. The engine is highly efficient and runs on liquid oxygen and methane. 
Now, after some setbacks with scrubs and aborts a few weeks ago, last week, Relativity Space finally got their chance to launch. And they did. The Terran 1 blasted off the launch pad from Launch Complex 16 at the Kennedy Space Center on the 23rd of March. The initial phase of the launch appeared to proceed smoothly, as the rocket effortlessly passed through Max-Q, demonstrating the capability of the rocket, of which 3D printed parts constitute 95% of its mass, to withstand the intense stresses during liftoff. Regrettably, the optimism was short-lived as the mission encountered a setback following the apparent successful separation of the first stage. There was a malfunction with the second stage Aeon engine, causing the mission to terminate prematurely, far before it reached its intended orbit. This incident serves as a stark reminder of the intricate and complex nature of spaceflight. I hope that the failure of this first launch won't deter the spirits of everyone at Relativity Space, and that the second time will be the charm. What was your favourite story this week? Mine was probably finally being able to see the Terran 1 fly, though it was a shame that it wasn't a complete success. Artemis news is always fun as well, even if updates don't come in as rapidly as they do with Starship. Let me know what your favourite stuff was down below. And hey, if you enjoyed this video, then leaving a like down below really helps support me here. And hey, if you want to subscribe, I make these news videos every Monday to help you stay in the loop. And if you want to support me even further, then you could consider joining my Patreon or my YouTube channel membership scheme, uh, just like the names on the screen did on the left. It really helps uh, support what I do here. A lot of the footage I use requires me to pay royalties, so your support is always, always very much appreciated. Thank you everyone so much for watching today's episode of Space This Week and I'll catch you all in the next one.